So now we're going to talk about Grignard reagents. Now a Grignard reagent is formed when you take an alkyl halide, X, where X is oftentimes bromine, but it can be chlorine or iodine, plus magnesium in the presence of, and it's almost always done with diethyl ether. Other ethers will work, but it must be ether. And I've pretty much exclusively seen it with diethyl ether. What happens in this case is the magnesium will insert itself between the R and the X. It's known as oxidative insertion. That's not really part of this class, but that's what it's called. Now the R, magnesium, X. That forms what's known as the Grignard reagent. This is the Grignard reagent. This is a generic Grignard reagent, where R is pretty much any hydrocarbon or any carbon-based group. There are exceptions. There are limitations to this. And X is either chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Usually, bromine is typical. Iodine is also seen. Chlorine is less common, but can be done. Now, the Grignard reaction, the Grignard reagent, is generally thought of as R minus. Now, it's not an R minus. It's definitely this. It's, this is the structure. But it's going to behave as if it were an R minus. It's going to do basically the same things R minus would do. Okay? It can be a nucleophile or it can be a base depending on how it's treated. Okay? So now, take home messages. Grignard reagent is made by adding metallic mercury. Pardon me, not mercury. Metallic metallic magnesium to an R halide, where R can be any number of things, the magnesium will insert itself between the R and the X, and this Grignard reagent will behave as if it is R minus. Grignards are always done in ether, usually diethyl ether, and Grignards are very susceptible to water. There can be no water in this reaction, absolutely none which is one of the reasons why ethers are used, because they're fairly easy to purify. Take out that last part, five, four, three, two. Take out that last part. It's not true, there's lots of things you can make dry. So let's see a couple of examples of how Grignards can be formed. You can, one of the more interesting ones, at least for me, is you can actually take a halogenated benzene, you can add magnesium to that, and the presence of ether, and you can get the Grignard reagent. And that, of course, remember that behaves as if it were R minus. So this is going to give you similar reactivity, the Grignard reagent, as if you had this. So that's kind of cool that you can actually now have a phenyl group or an aromatic group as a nucleophile. It can do nucleophilic things, which is kind of cool. Uh, here's another example. Uh, iodine. And remember, that's going to behave as if it were. It's not, but it's going to behave like it is. Butyl minus. So these are Grignard reagents, and they're very powerful. Now, why am I introducing this in the alcohol chapter? Because Grignards are an extraordinarily common method of creating alcohols from, here it is, carbonyl-containing compounds. Ketones, aldehydes are very common. Also, esters and something called acid chlorides, which we'll get to in a moment. All right, so now that we've seen how to make a Grignard and what a Grignard reagent is and kind of how it behaves, it behaves like the R group with a negative charge, let's see what we can do with it. They're used primarily to make alcohols. So if we have a Grignard reagent, let's just draw a generic Grignard reagent. And we add that to a carbonyl-containing compound such as formaldehyde. What we will get from that reaction in the presence of ether is we will get 
we'll get this alkoxide anion, which then we react with a little bit of acid. This is after the reaction is done, after all this magic happens and all you have is this anion. Then you add some acid and that will give you the corresponding alcohol. So if you use a Grignard reagent and add it to formaldehyde, this one here, this is formaldehyde, you will get a primary alcohol. A primary alcohol. So using a Grignard reagent with formaldehyde will generate a primary alcohol. But Dr. Betts, you probably ask yourself, how do I make secondary alcohols? Very, very simple. Again, starting with a Grignard reagent, but now instead of formaldehyde, use a different aldehyde, an aldehyde that has an actual carbon-based group, such as this one. In the presence of ether, exactly the same. Everything's the same, except for this. We used a different carbonyl source. So now that's going to give us... Oops. Then once you've once the Grignard part of the reaction is done, you form the anion, the oxygen anion. Add some protons to this bad boy, and you will get a second degree alcohol. Now keep in mind, I use the methyl group here. Doesn't have to be methyl, could be any number of different things. But for this example, I use methyl. But again, as long as it's an aldehyde, you can put pretty much any carbon group you want out here to make any carbon group over here. And also, remember, Grignards can be a lot of different groups too. It's a very versatile reaction, very versatile indeed. But Dr. Betts, I hear you say, what if I wanted a tertiary alcohol? I've got you covered. Now, instead of using an aldehyde, use a ketone. Now I'm using the simplest ketone, acetone. Could be anything. Doesn't have to be methyls here and here. Could be anything. Could be isopropyls, methyl and an ethyl, um, butyl and a propyl. Doesn't matter. As long as it's a ketone, you will get an alcohol, a tertiary alcohol. Doesn't have to be acetone. Could be any ketone your heart desires. third degree alcohol. And there you have it. But I hear you say, Dr. Betts, what about a quaternary alcohol? Well, unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, there is no such thing as a quaternary alcohol. So you can only have primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohol. So that is Grignard. And what's what Grignards do? Let's take a look at the reaction of the Grignard. Let's see the mechanism. Let's do a, a specific example this time. Let's not, let's be more specific. Let's say we have methyl bromide. Methyl bromide reacting with magnesium and ether. Those are the classic conditions for, a, for forming a Grignard reagent. So there's my Grignard reagent. And now let's add our ketone. Let's use acetone. Why not? And that will give us, so this will be one. So we add the ketone first, and then we add protons. And that will give us a tertiary alcohol. Now, What's the mechanism of this reaction? So remember, 
that a Grignard reagent is equivalent to saying R minus. So this is going to be equivalent to saying CH3 minus. That's the same thing. Now, it's not. In the reaction, there's a lot more complexities going on here. But all you have to remember is that the Grignard reagent, whatever the R group is, that's going to be acting or behaving as if it were R minus. So now we have a ketone. And we have a CH3 minus. So now it's just going to be the arrow attacking the carbonyl carbon. And the lone pair of electro the pi bond will kick up to the oxygen as a lone pair. That's how that will work. And that will give you. this anion which now we're going to add protons to that's going to be step two right here and that will protonate from the uh, hydronium to give you the alcohol product. And the mechanism for Grignard reagents is the same. No matter what the Grignard reagent is, no matter what the carbonyl source is, as long as aldehyde or ketone, it will be the same mechanism. Okay? And that's just how it works. Very, very simple mechanism, really, for a very complicated and cool reaction. Now let's see what happens if we use a different carbonyl source. Instead of using a ketone or an aldehyde to make a primary, secondary, tertiary reaction, or pardon me, alcohol, let's see what happens when we use something like an ester or what's called an acid halide. So recall that you all should know that esters have the generic formula where R cannot be hydrogen, well, R primed. R primed cannot be hydrogen, so it has to be some kind of carbon group. So that's an ester. This is an ester here. So now let's take a look at an acid halide. An acid halide has a generic structure or generic formula, X. Now X in a Grignard reaction is pretty much never fluorine. But if I'm just telling you about a class of compounds, just naming the class, X can be fluorine. It's an acid fluoride, they're called. But in Grignard reagents, they're almost never fluorides. So X is usually, in Grignard reactions, X is usually chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And here's an example, or a specific example, of an acid halide. This is an acid chloride. Now these molecules, or these classes of molecules, will undergo Grignard reactions. No question about it. The cool thing is, they'll do them twice. Now here's why that works. Let's take a, an ester. Let's be specific here. Let's take this one. And let's react that with methyl Grignard. Let's change the color. Let's make it uh, black. There we go. So we can really see the contrast. Okay. Now we all know that this behaves as if it were methyl minus, okay? This methyl minus can now attack the carbonyl carbon, as we've seen before, kick up the pi bond. Remember, the carbonyl is made of a sigma and a pi bond, okay? The pi bond is the weakest of all the bonds in the, on that atom, so the pi bond breaks first. And you'll get what's known as a tetrahedral intermediate. Now at this point in the mechanism, if it was a ketone or an aldehyde, we would simply protonate the alkoxide and be done. 
In the acid chloride, however, the lone pair will come back down and kick off that group right there, the alkoxide or the methoxide. And now look what happens. We actually make a ketone. Now the cool thing is this. Another equivalent of the Grignard reagent will now attack the newly formed ketone. And give you the exact, or not the exact same, but it'll give you the alkoxide again. Now at this point, you add the protons. And that will protonate our alcohol, giving us the product. And there you go. There's the mechanism of using a Grignard reagent with an ester. Now, acid chlorides, acid bromides, and acid iodides will do the same thing, only they do it faster. Because now, as we can see here, we have this uh, methoxide going off as a leaving group. But you know yourself, chloride is a better leaving group. Chloride, we see it all the time being used in SN1E1 reactions, methoxide, unless you protonate it, probably isn't going to leave in those reactions. But it will leave here. It will leave here because it's a good enough leaving group to undergo these reactions, but not good enough to undergo a basic SN2 or a, a, a generic SN2 reaction. But in this reaction, it'll work. Now, chloride's a better leaving group. So this mechanism will work with chloride, acid chlorides or acid bromides or acid iodides because those are better leaving groups. So this will work but so will it work with an acid chloride, bromide, or iodide. Let's see that mechanism right now. You're going to see it's exactly the same mechanism. You're going to see that. So let's try um, something interesting. How about isopropyl Grignard? And let's do, I don't know, methyl Grignard. Uh, let's do an acid bromide. Acid bromide. So now, we all know, everyone in this lecture now realizes that this means that. So isopropyl with a negative charge in the center carbon. I think everybody will agree that this will attack the carbonyl carbon, kick up the pi bond onto the carbonyl oxygen. I think everyone in this room is okay with that. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why does the pi bond break? Why doesn't the bromine just leave on the first contact? And that's because the pi bond is the weaker of the two. So you have to make what is called a tetrahedral intermediate. Now here, the lone pair will come back down from the oxygen to reform the pi bond and kick off the bromide. You may be asking yourself, why doesn't this come back off? Well, you know yourself, Carbon with a negative charge is not a good leaving group. We had to go through great lengths to make the Grignard. We had to use magnesium and do all kinds of really special chemistry to make this. So it's hard to make carbon minus. And in fact, this is not what is, what's existing in the flask. It's more complicated than this. So making carbon minus very, is very difficult to do. Can be done, very difficult. So it's not going to happen here. Especially with the bromine, 
bromine is going to leave preferentially because it's a much better leaving group. All right, and that gives us back, or sorry, gives us back our carbonyl. And now we have an unsymmetrical ketone. There. There. Okay, so at this point, another equivalent of our Grignard comes by and says, how do you do? Tax the carbonyl carbon again. So Grignards are very, let me change the colors of those arrows, sorry. Grignards are very good at attacking carbonyl carbons, just like that. Same mechanism as here, same thing. Electrons attack the carbon, kick out the pi bond. Here, electrons attack the carbon, kick out the pi bond. Same mechanism. But now, the product that we get from that is this uh, alkoxide. But now these lone pairs that normally up here, we saw kick back down, kick off the bromine. Now they can't come back down because there's nothing to kick off. There's only carbon-based groups that are left. And I've just discussed that carbon-based groups are generally speaking, not good leaving groups. So at this point we protonate. And there's the product. So you'll, no, you'll notice if you compare this to the um, mechanism with an ester, you're going to see it's the same mechanism, exactly the same, only instead of a OR group, it's a halogen, bromine, chlorine, or iodine. Generally speaking, fluorine is not typically employed here. Okay? So now, what about using Grignards to add to epoxides? It's a very cool reaction that Grignards will do. Because Grignards are essentially R minus, that means that Grignards are nucleophiles. And they like to add to carbonyls, but they can also add to other electrophiles. How about this reaction? Let's take uh, this one. So here's my Grignard. It's going to make a phenyl Grignard. Why not, right? going to add that and we're going to use a, just a really simple epoxide. There we go. Epoxide has all that ring strain and torsional strain, angle strain and torsional strain, I guess it's called. So now, in this particular reaction, it's the same thing we've seen before. Where this is an equivalent to to that. Now here, the Grignard lone pair will attack one of the carbons. Now why is this going to work? Because of the ring strain of the epoxide. That's why it's going to work. The ring strain, the angle strain, the torsional strain inside of this ring makes these carbons electrophilic susceptible to attack. Because once they're attacked, the ring will open. Watch this now. The ring will open, putting the electrons on oxygen and forming a carbon-carbon bond. But it'll only do it once, of course, because you can only ever can only ever open an epoxide once. You can't open it twice. So the mechanism is only different in that you're opening an epoxide instead of just kicking up a pi bond to the oxygen. It's very similar, but not the same. I understand it's not the same. And, of course, 
lone pair deprotonates the hydronium to give you the protonated alcohol. And that's how it works. Not too shabby, huh? It's a pretty interesting little reaction. And it's just telling you about the versatility of the Grignard reaction. Very, very versatile reaction. Can do a lot. And there you go. So that's Grignards. So Grignards can add to carbonyl compounds, formaldehyde, aldehydes, ketones to produce an alcohol. Can also add to esters and uh, acid chlorides. Now there are limits. There are limits to the Grignard. It only works in ether. That's the first limitation. Only works in ether. Not everything's soluble in ether. So that's kind of a problem. But there's also things called organolithiums that can work around that problem. Organolithiums are very similar to Grignard's in that you can imagine that there are minuses. You know, if you have like a, a methyl lithium, consider it a methyl anion. Same as the Grignard's. The mechanisms are basically the same in terms of how you draw them on paper. Now, because it's an R minus, like a CH3 minus or an isopropyl minus or a phenyl minus, benzene minus, um, they're nucleophiles. But we've already learned in this class that if something is a nucleophile, it can also be basic. So you cannot have any acidic protons around in your Grignard reaction. You just can't have them. So if there's a carboxylic acid, the Grignard is going to deprotonate it right away. Grignards are indeed basic. For sure, they're basic, okay? So keep that in mind when you're doing your Grignard reactions or you're designing synthesis around Grignards. Can't have any acid, any, any acid protons at all, all right? And no water, too. It's the other limitation. It can be no water. Everything has to be pristine and very, 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 very dry. No water anywhere. And uh, so those are some of the limitations that Grignards have. They're not perfect. Nothing's perfect in chemistry. Uh, that's why we have numerous different ways to accomplish the same goal.